Hey, are there any bike people here? I used to say that all the time. Here we go. Here we go. All righty. Gary Fisher. Sure. Uh, you know, when I was asked to do this, I thought back to the pioneers of other industries. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, the word innovator is, is tossed around a lot. Um, and hard pain is involved in innovation. And Gary uh, changed the, the whole industry. So I wanted to first thank you sure. for your contribution. Tell us about what it was like when you started out and, and what sort of example you can, you can teach for the young people today. Well, I started uh, seriously riding a bike, racing, when I was 12 years old. It was 1962, you know, and at that time in the Bay Area here, I was in the Belmont Bicycle Club. There were 120 riders in all of Northern California. And I'll tell you, that was here, the Amateur Bicycle League of America. Mm -hmm. But like in those days, everybody that was a, thought of themselves as a serious bike rider joined. 120 people, you can't wow. imagine. And we were like, like you would see somebody on a bike there wasn't a kid or an obvious DUI victim, and you'd stop them and say, hey, let's exchange phone numbers. And it was a really insular little crowd. And you know, in these days, there's like on Facebook group of the dino riders and these guys, and it's like, you guys were my heroes as I was yeah. growing up. Well, I was working at a bike shop called Wheels Unlimited in San Rafael, and the owner just let me run the whole thing. He was never there. So that was a great place to put together this mongrel bike I was going to make. Because to me, I mean, I had already ridden cyclocross. That was a European style. Right, right. In uh, the 60s. I got photographs of it, you know, and stuff when we were doing that in the 60s. And it was real obvious. You put, just put gears and really heavy-duty brakes on a bike. And the first bike that I really designed and made with the thing was a lot like an oversized road bike. It was just a heavy-duty came to high tech. Right. And then I also made the point of using all the best dimensions and specifications of the highest end bikes because I wanted exception, acceptance from bike mechanics. At the time, I was also working for Bicycling Magazine. So I was a road tester, so I met everybody in the industry. So that really helped things. And a real pivotal moment was when we did the bike show in New York and we did a presentation about the mountain bike. And this presentation was well-practiced. Oh my God, when I think about it, Larry and Wendy Craig did all the photographs. Larry Craig is the steel guitarist for Neil Young. Okay, uh, uh -huh. the, uh, the, and Howie Hammerman was part of our crew. Howie Hammerman was George Lucas's third employee. So we had the run of George Lucas's uh, screening room in San Anselmo. And we go practice this presentation. We do slideshows there about once a month. Right. We got really good at it. Right. Because I got to tell you, presentation, this is the place we're at. This is the nexus we're at right now. Because you guys got to show this as something incredible that Gen Z is going to go, I want that. I don't care what you're saying, what bullshit you're giving me. I want this. Because there are powers that be that want to see this stopped. Stop, stop. You look over the hill here, you look at Standard Oil Refinery, they show no signs of shutting down. Nothing. Absolutely. Woo! Now that's real spirit. What, I, what I'm getting here is like, like it was a product of the time, it was a product of the place, it was a product of the people. Well, well it's also, we were, it's about space. Come on. There are all these miles and miles and miles and miles of open space in the outdoors that we had the golden key to go visit. Because this, I mean, I do things like I go out and hike with Sierra Club people. And you know, we go on this long hike, it take like about four hours. Man, I do it on my bike in about two hours, you know? And I remember one time being out with these guys and then admitting to them, I'm one of these mountain bikers. And this is really the early days when they were like this. And total silence for about a half an hour. Then they start talking to me and everything. And this is the secret. You've got to listen to people. You've got to spend the time to listen to people. You know, Jeanette uh, Sok Khan, you know, how did you do this in New York? He says, we went to a lot of meetings 
and we listen to people. That's a key thing. You don't have to do what they say, but you need to listen. If they don't feel listened to, you aren't even getting to the first step. They need, you know, I, I would say to one of my outside sales reps, we're going into this shop, we're gonna tell this guy, you've underperformed and we're opening a guy two miles away from you. You know what this guy's gonna say. He's gonna tell you you're making a huge mistake, the two of us aren't gonna sell beans. You know, you know what this guy's gonna tell you. You're going to listen to every single word, you're going to repeat some of the lines, you're gonna spend at least 45 minutes listening, okay and then you won't necessarily reach any kind of resolution right then. You say to them, look, I gotta go now. I'm gonna come back tomorrow at this time. You show up exactly on time tomorrow because people, we now have all the medical evidence, they sleep on it and guess what? They reach resolution. You're getting this much closer to reaching some resolution. It's about controlling your own emotion and learning how to deal with other people's emotion. Because emotion rules and facts are inflated and deflated to fit emotion and that's a human condition. And I have to remind all my wonderful, lovely geek friends that this is the way it works, you know? Like my brother, he's been the opposite of me. We love each other so much. We're just a few years apart. I mean, he went to Stanford, uh, you know, got uh, electronics, computers, uh, mathematics, he went to Tandem. He designed uh, hardware for eight years. He w went to Harvard, got an MBA, and then he joined me. <laughs> and, you know, we rocked, man. And Jeez, like, that sounds like me, actually. <laughs> uh, it's, like, it's like, you know, we had, I had, I was the ball juggler. I was the, the guy, the front man, the whole thing. Right. I would make the edict, we're going to do this, clear and simple. And he'd be the guy in the background checking all the numbers and right. making sure everything penciled out correctly. I loved going over spreadsheets with him. It was back in Lotus One, Two, Three days. Remember that? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, killer yeah. app. And um, we, oh, and back in the day, we had a telex too. We had this freaking machine be this big, and the thing would go off on its own, and everybody would gather around and go, ah, "What's coming through? What's coming through?" And everything. And, <laughs> and my friend Wiz, Wiz turned out to be. He turned out another sound guy. He, he turned out to work for, uh, oh, he did all the, uh, oh, what's the guy? <sighs> I'm having a brain fart. Sorry, guys. It's like uh, uh, the guy's a magician in England. Uh, He's the kid. I don't know, anybody? Blaine. No, no, no. The famous one. He did a bunch of sound for that. <laughs> you know, he's a sound guy, and he used to like, uh, God, I had some incredible people working for me. It was just so, crazy. Okay, so, so obviously you had an amazing context, your innovation. You had people, place, yeah. time, um, spaces, right? You, got, you had to be in the mountains. You had to oh, wide open places. Yeah. And the chemistry of it all, it seemed like... So let me ask you this. Do you think it was inevitable that it happened? And would it have happened had it taken, you know somewhere else and you hadn't uh, done it you hadn't well, done it what, would somebody else had done it uh well there were already people doing it it's like at the time i mean in 1979 1980 um well i was subscribing to a british magazine called cycling weekly and in there they had an ad for the rough stuff fellowship which had been going on in the uk for a long time and then i got a hold of their newsletter and then here's this guy jeff apps right he's doing it too Amazing! I call him up. I tell, like, you know, I send him mess, you know, letters and stuff, and he sent me a bunch of tires that he was using. 700C by 42, Hakapa Valta from uh, Finland. Finland, yeah. Okay, this is the size we're using now, 700C. You know, we made the, rebel, the step to that, but at the time, you could buy a 26, two, uh, you know, 26 inch 2125 Uniroyal Nobby. They were in every single bike shop in the United States for $11.95. Yeah. So that was the size I was going to go with. Because part of the whole thing was going to be, this thing has to be repairable and serviceable, that whole thing. And the guys that helped me, like I said, I did the show in New York. And the people that were there predominantly were the Japanese. Oh, my God. Wow. And they started showing up in my office. And within a couple of months, I went to Japan. And my philosophy there is, I'm going to tell you guys everything I know for free. Absolutely. And you in return are going to give me first delivery, best price in dating. Right. And my first big loan was from the Japanese government. Can you imagine that? 
you know, the money was harder to get, especially for somebody that didn't have any track record back then. You so know, the Japanese it, government funded you in order to get their manufacturers to start this new business well, well, supplying. Well, just to like, just so I could buy, a, you know, two or three containers at a time. You know, and, right, and right, because they got the money back because you placed the order. Oh, and it started a whole big thing. And at the same time, like I sent Mike Senior, then at Specialized, bought four bikes from me, and he's an old friend, and I knew what he was going to do. He liked it. He says these are great. These are great. So he's yeah, I knew he was going to copy it. So I go down to his warehouse one day and he says, Gary, check this out. And he shows me these bikes he brought in and they're almost identical to mine. And like my partners, my, everybody else was flipping out saying, how could he? And I, could just, I said, how could he not? How could he not? Right. You know? And it's like this. When you have five competitors that are righteous competitors, people take you seriously. Because we are an orphan company. We we're the only one doing something like that. And they could doubt it. When you have five legitimate companies, all of a sudden it turns the corner. Now, what's happened here is crazy. It's like, you know, we've yeah. for Trek and we do B-Cycle, you know. And a few years ago, I said, hey, man, there's crazy money in your category. It's best for you to step outside right now because, you know, you aren't going to be able to beat these guys because they got crazy money. So the whole world's changed. So let's fast it. forward to the present. Yes. What's your impression? You've been here before. Yes. Tell us what you think about if you want to talk about mountain bikes or you want to talk about e-bikes, well, but we want like, to talk about like what I we're doing. It's like I see the guy, wheels, doing the bike that steers itself. You know, I was thinking about that for the last year. I, I've, been, I've said a lot of times, the act of riding a bicycle has never been fully defined. Well, you know what? I think it is getting very close to being fully defined, and I know we can do this. And then also this uh, pedal by wire. Okay, right. I worked for the Whole Earth Catalog. Jay Baldwin, who is the head of uh, Nomadics here, Oh man, he wrote a big long dissertation to me why that would work. Unfortunately, it's all was printed on a dot matrix and it's fucking gone. <laughs> <laughs> Whole Earth Catalog, by the way, is, is, is this, this institution uh, where Steve Jobs got the phrase, uh, stay hungry, stay foolish. That was, well, yeah. he lifted it from that, that very uh, publication. Well, well, you know what it was like? Like back in the day, I did light shows, okay? And light shows, you don't know, you don't know what they are. It's like people say, oh, laser lights. No, we didn't have lasers. That hadn't been invented yet, man. It was all liquid lights and like all these slide projectors and 16 millimeter film projectors. And I modified everything, you know? And in fact, my partner, Alan Cooper. Alan Cooper is uh, the father of Visual Basic, and he had a big company called Cooper.com downtown, had a big floor, and he had companies like IBM and Sony as his clients to make stuff. I mean, he wrote the book, you know, The, the Inmates Are Running the Asylum, right? right? Which Heard is about how the engineers are screwing everything up. And Jobs is right. You've got to make your demands on the engineers. This is what I want. This is what I want to achieve and everything. You know, so that, you know, I love this stuff, you know. But so, 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 you see in a innovation and in, you know in, in brilliant software sensing, the, uh, the yeah. kind of breakthroughs that, that like you know a cycle guy could just like dream thirty years ago. What else motivates you about you know what we do? Like, like, like I talk about stirring the heart. Are we destined to make a dent in the universe? Well, there is no way we will get to net neutral without a robust adoption of micromobility. Absolutely right. Period. Amen. That's it. It's just not possible. Flat out. That's what know? we're figuring out. It's, you know, one Tesla battery equals 200 e-bike batteries. That's just, that's the ratio. Is it, you know, you can no longer, you know, expect to go around if your rumpus room, your toolbox, your beauty parlor, or your kitchen, everywhere you go. You know, they, we've been sold on that concept and we've been given that concept and the new one they're adding to it is like, hey, there's some scary neighborhoods out there. Don't you want to lock your doors and keep your space and everything? You don't want to take public and you don't want to be out in front of everybody. And man, that is slow death yeah. you know, to the human being to like stay in this glass steel box and spend your whole day in there and be scared. Yeah. You know, they got us doing it in front of the TV set a long time ago. I stopped watching that stuff because, it was, you know, it's like television is very different in the United States than the rest of the world. You go to the UK and they'll have like, uh, there'll be four BBC channels or five, 
you know, five public stations there in the UK and then 17 stations from outside the nation. And right. here we've got 350 stations, you know, and you can't make up your mind yeah, where well, you're going to. And it's a big wasteland. And it's like, at the same time, it's like, I'll go to Germany and see uh, the stations from Cuba and Venezuela. Never absolutely. here, you know. It's like we got our own form of propaganda. Believe me. My grandfather worked in propaganda for Warner Brothers in World War II. You know, it's like what we do in, in politics is you go up to the highest level and you go like this. Thank you, Mr. Democrat. Thank you, Mr. Republican. And you say to yourself, thank God there's only party, two parties, and you hedge your bets, and you're a fool if you don't. That's how American business works right now. You know, you wonder, why do these things get passed and done? Well, what we got to do is raise some tremendous arguments and do some tremendous marketing with what? Our kids, because they get it. They get it really easily. And then we got to stand really hard against some of these, uh, these decisions and everything. You know, I was under impressed today. I heard from the mayor of New York that they're going to spend $7.2 million on infrastructure for bicycles. Those are squirrel nuts. Give me a frickin' lane. I want the whole thing, you know. You guys have blown your chance. You had 100 years to show us that you could do good. You've caused massive crushing death. You've caused death by fine particulate, and you failed on your basic promise of delivering human beings. Oh, must I go on? All right. Well, on that note, there's Gary Fisher. I'd love to continue the conversation. Let's do that over beer, over uh, at happy hour, and, and we get to all talk to each other like in the old days. Thanks again, Gary. Hey, look at this. Woo! All right, we good? So hard, I lost my Everybody, Gary Fisher. <laughs>